quite a while ago, when we're still meeting in uh, at Lucky Shoals Park, going through the book of Joshua, came across, uh, we went through Joshua chapter 10, and Joshua chapter 10 has the story where Joshua tells the sun to stand still, and, and you know, there's that great victory, and there's that great miracle of the extended day, and things like that. And in that sermon, I briefly touched on the flat earth. And I'd mentioned, I said, man, I've got all these, I, I had, I kept these notes, I have all these notes from a website that says, you know, oh, there's, you know, over 200 Bible verses that prove a flat earth. And if I had time, I wanted to get through these. And I didn't have time, so I, I had said, you know what, I'll just get back to this on another day. Well, there's been some recent events that have happened lately, and I'm back on the subject for today. So, I, we started off reading in Proverbs 26, and I want to give a little bit of an explanation on how I deal with things here. And hopefully you've all known this to be true in general, that you know when people have questions, when people want to talk about things, I try to be as open as I can. I like to sit down and discuss things and try to help you to understand if there's any way I could help. That is the spirit and attitude that I have. But um, that's just in general, by and large, that is what I'll try to do. But the Bible says here in Proverbs 26, verse 4 and 5, Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou also be like unto him. Answer a fool according to his folly lest he be wise in his own conceit. And one of the things you learn from that is, you know what, there's not a good way to deal with a fool. Because if you answer him, you know, he says, answer, a fool, answer not a fool according to his folly, lest I'll be also like to him. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. The Bible also says in t Titus 3.9, but avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. A man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth being condemned of himself. So while I do want to have discussion with people and talk, I'm going to avoid foolish questions. I'm also going to avoid contentions, right? So... If you have legitimate questions that you want to have answered, I am happy to, to try to help you to understand something. But I'm not going to fight with anybody about doctrine. I'm not going to get in any debates. I'm not going to get in any strivings and contentions. I'm going to teach what the Bible says, and that's the way it is. As a pastor of this church, that's what I'm going to do. And, you know, don't come to me trying to, to change my mind, especially on foolishness. If someone comes to me and tries to tell me that there's lizard people that are shapeshifters and everything else, I won't entertain that for a second. Now, look, everyone could say, okay, that sounds really ridiculous. Well, there's people out there that believe that. Okay, but that is an example of something that I won't even entertain the thought of. I'm not going to sit here and have, a, and have a, a, a debate and a discussion about you. I put the flat earth in the same category as that. And I'm going to explain now today. So what I want to do, because I don't want to just leave everything just off and just say, well, I'm not going to touch this. I want to preach a whole sermon this morning going through the verses that I found to be, because look, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not ignorant of what people say that believe in a flat earth. I have listened to the videos, I've watched them, I've looked at it. I'm not just, oh, well, you know, you can't, you're, you, he that answereth a matter before he heareth is folly and shame. I've heard it. I know what it says. I know what people teach. I mean, I can't say I know what everybody says because I haven't heard everybody. But you get a general consensus of what people are spouting out there. And I have, you know, probably someone who's claiming to have the most verses that support the flat earth that I'm going to go through this morning. So in the future, if anybody has this question, because I don't want to sit down and have a discussion or a debate or really go over this, I'm going to point them to this sermon. Amen. And that's one of the reasons why I'm preaching this sermon today, just so that it can be out there. This is what I believe about it. Don't come to me trying to change my mind on this because it ain't going to change. And we might go a little bit over today because there's a lot of content that I want to, I want to cover just trying to make sure that it's just, just out there completely. And tonight's sermon is going to be along the same lines. 
Not on flat earth specifically, but the night sermon, I don't always tell what we're going to be preaching tonight, but tonight's sermon is going to be about using uh, reasoning skills and logical fallacies. Because it's important to understand, you know, how to analyze things and, and how to even just get good doctrine and, and how to look at material and evidence and come to a conclusion without making a mistake or without being led astray by a false teacher that's using faulty evidence to try to convince you of something. So that's going to be tonight's sermon. So they're, they're kind of going to go hand in hand, but I'm going to try not to overlap with any of this. I'm really going to focus mostly on this. Now, Before we even get into this, just so, so people are aware, because I know what all the, I know what so many of the arguments against this are going to be. First of all, I love science, and anyone who's known me knows that. I, I really, I've always loved science. It's been one of my favorite subjects. Science and math, I've excelled at. Those have been my, my points of interest. And when I was growing up, before I got saved, I used to believe in evolution. I used to think everyone that didn't believe in evolution was a moron, an idiot, uneducated, completely unsmart. Why? Because that's what was being taught and that's what was being pushed in elementary school. And that was, was being taught as fact when it really wasn't a fact. And after I got saved, I knew that there was a problem because there was a stark contradiction that is just completely unavoidable in the belief of the way that the Big Bang and evolution is taught versus what the Bible literally says in Genesis chapter 1. That is undeniable that there is a very, very large difference there and it's completely contradictory. Okay, so when I started actually challenging what I had been taught, I realized and, and still being able to use scientific analysis on what's being taught that I wasn't told the whole picture that there's actually assumptions that go into their facts and their evidence as to why things are the way are, where, how they age things and stuff like that. And when you look into the process of how they come up with their solutions, they are basing things off of assumption. They're using bad logic to make conclusions. That is a fact. Okay. The reason why I'm even bringing this up is because I'm not afraid to challenge things that are, I've assumed to be fact, I've assumed to be true, that I've been brought up with my whole life. It's not that I'm afraid of facing something and like, oh man, well, what will people think of me? I don't care. There's going to be people like me out there that, that before I was saved, before I came to this understanding, I used to think people like me now were idiots. And I'm okay with that. I understand that. That's fine. So that's not, I don't have this fear of, oh, well, you just don't want to believe in a flat earth because you don't want people to call you. That's not it at all. Right. That's so that don't think and assume of, of why does Pastor Burzins not want to believe this? Look, I've already changed what I believe. And I do change what I believe. I will change what I believe to match the Bible. But the thing is, the flat earth is not taught in scripture and I'm going to show you just based on this evidence based on what other people are claiming how is this taught in the Bible and I'm going to cover the Bible aspect first and then I'm going to briefly go over just some basic science because let's face it science look God's word is truth we know God's word to be true no matter what God's word trumps everything as just being the truth regardless however God's word doesn't contradict truth because truth is truth. So like, for example, just real simple, two plus two is four. Like, there's nothing contradictory there. Now, does the Bible specifically say two plus two? It doesn't have to. Because God gave us minds to understand things that are just reasonable and make sense. And, and the truth is the truth. Now, if something is contradicting the Word of God, the Word of God is true. But here's the other thing. I don't like when people say, well, if the Bible said 2 plus 2 is 5, I'm just going to believe it because it's the Word of God. I understand your heart's in the right place, but we don't have a God that's that dumb and, or, or, or that's that deceitful and a liar to try to, to make you just believe something that just simply is not true. Because that just simply is not true. Two plus two is not five. Like that, there is no getting around that or way of explaining it away. 
The, very simple, very straightforward. God made laws, God made rules, God designed a system for everything to operate and to function. And it's orderly. That's, I mean, that's why you have laws of physics. That's why you, you can observe things that are repeatable over and over again. You know, in the Bible, when, when it talks about a prophet and knowing who's a prophet of the Lord, it says, well, hey, when a prophet speaks and those words actually come to pass, that's a prophet. And when, and when a prophet speaks something and it doesn't come to pass, you know that's a false prophet. Well, when it comes to real science, when you can create reproducing and make predictions and it always just keeps happening the way it's supposed to happen the way the way that's been predicted to happen well yeah, at the very least you can say we've got a good working model of how things operate and we do have a good model of how things operate and the you know i'm again i'm not going to get into that i'll get into that later because i want to first just start off with in in my and the people i'm really trying to reach today are the people who think that the Bible teaches this. And the reason why I don't like this, this subject at all or the, 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 the fact that this is even out there and being promoted by people that are Christians saying that this is what the Bible teaches is it makes the Bible look dumb. It makes people who believe the Bible look stupid and dumb and ignorant when, when it's not. And the Bible doesn't teach this, but you start to say that and, and it's completely false. But let's look at, so here I, I printed off from a website, I think it was Flat Earth Doctrine, was the name of the website, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. And they claim, and I forget the exact number, over 200 plus verses that prove the Earth is flat. Now, before we even get started, you're gonna start noticing this, and we'll, we'll cover this tonight, but the reason why they say, oh, there's over 200 verses is because they're trying to make you think and have this perception that there's this mountain of evidence. Because that way, it's a way to protect themselves and say, well, I mean, if you disprove one or two verses or five verses or 10 verses, well, you still just have all these other verses. And people who are lazy and don't want to look at things critically and don't want to look it up will be more likely just to be like, oh man, well, I mean, if there's that much evidence, it must say so. And especially the people who don't really care that much, who aren't Christian right now, and they'll say, oh yeah, well, if there's that many verses, if these Christians are saying there's that many verses to support a flat earth, then it probably does. Right. When it doesn't. Okay. So we're going to look at these verses that, that are used to claim that the earth is flat. The vast majority have, don't even reference the shape of the earth at all. Not even, not even a little bit. Not once does it reference the shape of the earth. Now, before I even get into this too, I just want to make one more, one more point. I'm preaching against this like I preach against so many other things. This doesn't mean that a person is not welcome in our church if they believe this. You can believe what you want. There are certain things that, you know, the, the, the list is spelled out in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 on who's not going to be allowed in church. And we're not going to add to God's law. We're not going to make things more difficult, right? But as with any other doctrine or any other belief, you know, I don't want people, and we haven't had this happen at all, but I don't want people going around and, and starting to spread and teach different things than, than what the, the official stance is of the church and, um, you know, start to cause so discord and, and cause problems that way. But this isn't to um, attack anybody in particular. It's just I'm trying to preach the Bible like any other sermon I'll preach on any other topic, okay? So let's look at this. Their first, the very first thing that they say is, the earth was created before the sun. And they list Genesis 1, 1 through 19. So how does that prove a flat earth? I know that the earth was created before the sun. It doesn't say anything about the shape. It just says it was created. Okay, that's an order of events. That has no way is a proof text. And to, to, to even just start off, this is number, I, I've, this is printed directly from the website. This is the first thing that I come across in their list. Okay, now look, you say, oh yeah, but I didn't create that. Somebody, look, I know, but this is, the reason why I picked this one is because it's supposed to be really comprehensive. 
Okay, I'm trying to cover as much as I can. This does not mention, and you cannot prove flatness on order. It can be a triangle. It, when it was created has no relevance. I mean, the only thing I could think of is they're trying to say that, well, that makes Earth at the center, but at best you're stretching for geocentricity, which isn't flat Earth. They're two different things. And just, and just I might, I'm going to probably refer to that throughout the sermon. Geocentricity, I mean, geo is like the Earth, and centric is the center. So there's people out there who believe that, that the Earth is the center of like the universe, or at least of our system. Versus the heliocentric model, which is the one that's commonly accepted today, that the sun is at the center of our solar system and that there's planets revolving around the sun. So those are the two, you know, two viewpoints. But neither of those have anything to do with the actual shape and the order and makes no difference at all. So that's kind of ridiculous right off the bat. The next point says the universe is complete, not ever expanding. And they reference Genesis 2.1. Uh, you know, God made everything. It's okay. That's fine. And you know what? I don't have a problem accepting that, right? I'm not saying, and look, and let, me, let me make this point clear too. I'm not saying that everything that any scientist tells you is true, for one. I'm not saying that every single detail of what is out there on this topic is true. It doesn't mean I subscribe to everything that's out there. There are observations that are made about the way that light travels, things like that, and there's assumptions made on that too in astronomy. They make assumptions on things. And, and that's a huge thing, especially going back to creation. A lot of false conclusions are made based on assumptions. Like, instead of, you know, when you realize God created everything, He didn't create everything as an infant, as a baby, as a, you know, something that's, he created everything with an age. And everything, you know, as he spreads out, you, there's so much we don't really completely know to make a basis foundation of, of how things were at the creation and how old things were appearing on day one, day two, day three, you know, at the end of the first week. Adam was not a week old or a day old when God had him. Um, I mean, he, he was literally a day old right? When he was naming all the plants and animals. But he wouldn't have appeared at all if you were to do an examination using any scientific method that we have today to determine his age. They're going to say, well, I mean, he's this tall and his organs are this much, you know, developed. And this, you know, we know that they, at this point, you know, it takes this many years to develop to this, to this point. So the dating would be wrong on day one. And it's the same thing that you can apply to the astronomy and things like that. So look, I'm not saying that I subscribe to everything that people who don't believe the Bible and come up with their own theories on how everything came into being, I don't subscribe to all that. But we're just talking about the shape of the earth. So it, it's, it's a fallacy to say that, oh, because maybe the earth isn't always expanding, that that all of a sudden proves that the earth is flat. Again, not a proof. Not a proof at all. The earth measurements are unknown. And they, and they go to, uh, turn to Job 38, because we're going to spend a little bit of time in Job. Not much. I'm going to try to cover as much of this as possible. I should have had all these verses probably printed out because it's too much to, to be able to turn to everything. I'm going to try to group these in a, because he already groups them. The person who made this have, has these grouped in categories. So we're not going to turn to every verse because they've already grouped them into the point that they're making. And that's fine. And I can accept that without turning to all of them and just say, okay, yeah, these are all saying the same thing. So we're not going to turn to all of the individual verses. They're making the same point. So here's a point. And they've got multiple reference here. But Job 38, they have verses 4 through 5, verse 18, Jeremiah 31, 37, Proverbs 25, 3, for the earth measurements being unknown. Job, again, but again, what does this have to do with the shape? If the measurements are unknown, wouldn't that apply to flat and glo globe? I mean, if it's unknown, it's unknown. I mean, how can you say it's unknown for a sphere, but not unknown for a flat? Well, unknown literally would mean unknown. So that line of argument, again, doesn't hold any water for the shape. Yet again, but here we are. 
one, two, three points in, and where's the proof? Where, how are these verses supporting this? They're not. Verse number four of Job 38. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest, or who hath stretched the line upon it? So God is asking Job, saying, well, hey, where were you when I made everything, when I made the foundations of the earth? Hey, let me know if you know. He says, who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest, or who hath stretched the line upon it? What we have today as far as measurements, they're all going to be approximations. Nothing is going to be exact because you can't take a tape measure or a line or anything and, and, and just, <laughs> it's just, it's just physically impossible. So you can't get an exact of doing things that way. But you can use formulas and other things to give you close estimations, right? But it's, not, but it's never going to be exact. You're never going to have the exact measurements. And that's what this is saying, and I'm fine with that. Again, but that doesn't prove either. And, and, and look, a lot of these we're going to look at, I'm not saying that this proves a globe either. So don't think that I'm saying, oh, well, this all just proves... No. There's actually very little, very little in Scripture that talks about the shape of the earth. It's, it's extremely small. And I'm fine with that. <laughs> I'm not up here trying to convince the whole world that the, the, that, the, that the earth is a globe. I don't care. That's, that's not, that's not, the Bible doesn't emphasize this, but see, some people have gotten this in their mind to just make it all about that. Like, this is just the, the, the biggest conspiracy in the entire world that, you know, one of the most important things that everyone needs to know about this, and to me, that's, it, it, that doesn't hold any water either. Look, I believe that there are conspiracies, too. I'm not trying to poo-poo the idea of there being conspiracies or even conspiracies on a large scale. Talk to me about that. I'll tell you the ones that I believe in and the ones I don't. But I try to take them on a case-by-case -case basis and look at the evidence to see what makes sense. And, and, and I'll tell you this much, the more people that have to be involved in a conspiracy, the less likely it is to be true, especially when you don't have people coming forward as being part, uh, like a whistleblower coming part forward. Because you can contain it on, on smaller scales, contain secrecy. You can threaten, you can, you can do all this stuff. I mean, that's how conspiracies exist. It's a fact. They're, they exist. It's real. But the, the bigger you get, when you start getting into the thousands or tens of thousands of people just all involved in this same, and, 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 and crossing and spanning generations and generations and generations, and there is just like nobody that says, man, this is all, you know, I was part of this. Here's the evidence. Here's what I was told. Here's, you know, you start to doubt. Well, maybe, maybe, maybe there is an ex a conspiracy there, but I don't want to get all into that either. So, Earth measurements unknown. Man, I got to go a lot quicker. Does not consider the shape at all. We're staying Job 38. I'm not even going to turn to these other ones about the Earth measurements being unknown because inconsequential. Here is one now where we're finally getting into a shape. And they say Earth is a disk slash circle, not a ball. And right off the bat, there's an assertion made, but you're not going to see in any of these verses disc in the Bible. Right. So they just want to say, well, it's my version of what a circle is, not yours. But the scripture's not going to say disc. It is going to say circle, but it will not say disc. So why, why is your circle better than my circle? Just because. No real evidence, just because. Just, here's some Bible verses. Okay, one of them in here is Job 38, verses 13 through 14. And we're going to read a little bit more to get it in context here. Imagine that context. All right, let's get context of Scripture. Job 38 is a really interesting, I love, Job 38 is awesome. This is God responding to Job, right? And, and, and God just like pours out 
all of this information while he's like it through the means of like asking him these questions right and just trying to make Job like man he's really small and God just like boom boom and hitting him with all this stuff but this is this is just a really cool just Job 38 Job 39 you know like like read anyways let's let's start here um, how far up let's start in verse 4 where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. And we're going to get to foundations in a little bit. I, that should be on here. Uh, who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who, hath, or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Or who shut up the sea with doors? when it break forth, as if it had issued out of the womb. When I made the cloud the garment thereof, and thick darkness a swaddling band for it, and break up for it my decreed place, and set bars and doors, and said, Hitherto shalt thou come, but no further, and here shall thy proud waves be stayed. So in this short section that we're reading, he's talking about the creation of the earth, and then he goes on about the sea, right? Just the waters having a boundary, being shut up. There's gate, you know, at one point with the flood, the, the great fountains of the deep break forth, okay, and flooded the whole earth with the rain. And then all the water went back into the earth. And he says, I, I shut up the gates. We, you know, everything, the waves, they, they, they only go up so far. And, and there's this boundary, and the seas remain in their areas. What is this talking about? Okay. And then he continues on here. He says, Hast thou commanded the morning since thy days and caused the day spring to know his place? Now it's talking about the sun or the light coming up. It says, the, uh, Commanded the morning since thy days, caused the day spring to know his place, that it might take hold of the ends of the earth, that the wicked might be shaken out of it. Now, we're getting into, you might call it poetic language, but it's, 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 this isn't, none of this is meant to be, while it is giving wisdom and truth, absolutely, this isn't designed to give you a schematic like a science textbook would give you. That's, that's not the purpose of God's word in Job 38. So when he's saying this, of course it has meaning. All words have meaning, and there's teaching being taught here. But the point isn't to derive the actual shape of the earth from. So we're going to get to the verse that they're claiming in just a second here, because he says, As thou commanded the morning since thy days, and caused the day spring to know his place, that it might take hold of the ends of the earth. That's talking about the light taking hold of the ends of the earth, shining over all the earth that the wicked might be shaken out of it. Why? Because the wicked do the deeds of darkness. They don't like the light shining on them. Again, very simple concept being, being taught here. And then it says, It is turned as clay to the seal, and they stand as a garment. So, well, what is turned? It is turned. What I've seen people try to say here is that, oh, well, the earth is turned as clay, making it flat, because when you press a seal, it's made flat. So they see that's saying that the earth is flat. No, it is talking about the light being turned. Not the light being clay. It, it's turned as the clay is turned. When you, when you press a seal, it's, it's referring to the motion being turned, not the flatness of the seal. It is turned as a clay to the seal and they stand as a garment. The wicked, and then it continues on, and from the wicked, their light is withholden, and the high arm shall be broken. Light on wicked is in the context of what's being taught here. Nothing talking about it being the earth being flat at all. I mean, that is a huge, if, if that's what you want to say is your evidence, that is extremely lacking to try to come up with that conclusion. But let's continue here. So, and again, this is under the earth is a disc or circle. This does not say 
anywhere. The earth is a disk or so. You have to really do a lot of, well, this means this and this means this and, and start applying and interpreting the Bible to suit. A anyway, if you, if you put this scripture in front of anybody and just said, okay, here's what I'm giving you. What's the shape of the earth? What's the shape of the earth? You're not going to derive anything off of that at all. No, I don't care who you are. You can't, you can't just take this passage. It's people trying. They, they already have decided this is what it is. Now, let's see what we can find to make it fit. And this is, this is backtracking the, the evidence back in there. That is not evidence. Proverbs 8, 27 Oh, yeah. Proverbs 8, 27. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the depth, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the foundations of the deep. When he set a compass. So there's, here's what they'll say. Well, you think of like, a, you know, the compass where you have the, the point and you draw circles with it, right? That's not what the word compass is talking about here. There are, there are different definitions of the word. It's not the instrument or the tool. When he set the compass, it's, it's like when you compass something round about, you're, you're encompassing it. He's putting the, 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 the ends of the seas together. You're encompassing it around. Well, just like he said in the previous passage in Job, you know, he set the bounds on the sea. That's what it means when you're compassing it. Now, you don't have to believe me, but look it up for yourself. Look up the definition of the word compass. You'll see that it's not just a tool or an instrument that's used. And even if it were, even if, let's just say, let's just say I'm not saying that the word compass can't be used in that sense. I know that it is. I have a compass, okay? as a tool. That's not the only definition, but let's say that that is the definition that this is, which it's not, that that's being used here. He said he set a compass on the face of the depth. You can still use the compass if you wanted to, on a sh especially on a shorter area on the face of the depth. Not the whole thing. You know, this isn't, this is again, isn't talking about the shape of the earth. You can't derive that from this. Now let's go to Isaiah 40, because this one actually brings up a shape. Isaiah 40, verse 22. It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. We have a shape. Finally. After all these verses, we have a shape. It's a circle. Amen. I believe that. A circle, however, is a two-dimensional reference. Literally. And I've, I've heard people say, well, I take the Bible literally. And we're going to get to, you know what, I'll probably just get to that now. Because I'm totally running out of time. I'm spending way too much time on some of these verses, but... People say, I take the Bible literally. And this is where it started in Joshua. Son, stand thou still. Well, I take that literally. So that means the son 
was moving and it, and it had the sense of that it had to be the motion of the sun in order to stand still because I take the Bible literally. Well, if you're going to take the Bible literally, then when it says upon the circle of the earth, circle, if you take that literally, is a two-dimensional object. Yeah. It always has been. Right. What, what, it, what everything <laughs> has to do with is man's perception of things. The book is written for man to understand based on what we see around us. Everything makes sense. Look, even people, here, here's how, you know, one way of proving a point, because this is how people are, this is how language are, language is, language are. People who believe that we are on a globe and that the earth is rotating and traveling around the sun, all say, refer to the sunrise and the sunset and the sun going down Everybody does. <coughs> Even with a full-on belief that, well, it's not the sun actually causing that motion, we, we, we refer to things in terms of how we see them. And that's how you understand things and talk about them. And it, it's just, it's common language. But if you nail someone down and say, well, do you think the sun's really, no. But you refer to things that way, just like you see a circle, well, it looks like a circle. Well, it's not, I mean, it's not literally a two-dimensional object as a circle, but it's a circle. What, you know, and, and again, this is, there's so many places, and I'll challenge you, when you just challenge, go through the scripture and try to force a hyper-literal interpretation on every single thing that you read, and if you're honest with yourself, you'll realize you can't do it and have the Bible make sense. You just can't. Because there's this basic, I mean, it's, it's literature. It's divine literature, but it's still literature <laughs> that has to use some understanding. And, and, just, and I'll call it basic common sense. That when you're, when you're reading about things being described, I mean, the Bible uses hyperbole. It does. The Bible uses language that is meant to drive home a point about something without just having to take it to its most literal end. And that doesn't somehow make the Bible or Scripture untrue. Right. It's, it's a manner of speaking and teaching and, and, and helping people understand a point. I, I, I feel kind of weird that I even have to explain that, but because, you know, I'll be the first one to say, yeah, I believe the Bible is literal. Because, and when I say that, we're not trying to just, just fabricate some completely different explanation than what the verses actually say. But let's let the Bible speak for itself and understand just the way language operates. When the Bible says here is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, I don't know. Oh, and one more thing about the point of, of perception. Okay. And, and especially for people who want to take this from a flat earth perspective. If you really take the Bible literally, then that means the sun has to be moving up and down. I have not seen a flat earth model that you can get that actually demonstrates the world that we live in with the sun and the moon going up and down. Rising and setting, and that being the cause for dawn, and that being the cause for night, going up and down. You, can, you cannot make a model that works. So the problem is that people, they want to say, oh, well, I believe the Bible literally, but then when it actually comes to trying to make it work, you just come up with something totally different. Well, you see, we've got this flat plane, and the sun's going like this. Well, wait a minute. I thought you said that you take the Bible literally. Well, sunset, I mean, yeah, it's, by, it's from the perspective of the observer. Oh, oh, okay, so when you make the model, yep. then it's okay to take that liberty. But when someone else that says something that you don't like uses the same understanding of, of then, then it's a problem. Yep. Then it's, well, you're not taking the Bible literally. And look, I spent plenty of time trying to find a working model 
just someone, people who believe in flat earth, because a lot of people out there, I believe, genuinely believe this, a working model, a working model of the seasons, eclipses, time zones. Okay, there's so many factors that factor into the way our world works and distances. There's lots of different maps out there of the world and they all have their benefits and they all have their flaws. They all, they, they're used for different purposes because you're trying to represent uh, and, and this is why there's been, you know, there, there are different maps. But they, again, they have different uses. So like you've got topographic, topographical maps, you've got the, the maps like the UN has on their flag where everything is flat on a disk that can show you the, um, the latitudinal lines going across, right? The, the, um, but the problem is, so let me put it this way. You have two different objects. Let's say, here's your competing theories. You've got a globe, a sphere versus a disk. Okay, and I know there's lots of people that do all kinds of, let's just compare these two. It's actually really easy to show that there, there are some very simple measurements that because a globe has arcs, it has curves, when you're measuring distances, if you were to try to flatten that out, it's going gonna, it's gonna to have problems because you can't take something that's inherently curved to, to make it flat. So your map's going to have problems. Now, if you have something that's automatically flat, well, you've got some really easy calculations that you can, that you can actually... And, and either way, you have easy calculations. So they're not, neither one is, is really complicated. My point is, even just measuring distances between places will give you your answer one way or the other. I mean, at least you'll be able to demonstrate, well, if you're saying it's this, and I'm saying it's this, they, they're incompatible when it comes to just physical measurements. Right. Completely incompatible. Yeah. Because your distance is going to be different on a straight line versus a curved line right. between two points. And there's so many ways to prove this, and I'm, I'm kind of jumping ahead of myself now with, with, with all the ways to prove this. Let's, um, let's stay here in Isaiah chapter 40 because I want to I'm not saying that this proves a disc or a globe because it says circle. I think circle can apply to either one because it, it can. Because if you're viewing something that's a circle, well, if you're looking at a disc from the top, it looks like a circle. Okay. If you're looking at a sphere, you're going to see a circle. Right. And if you can't acknowledge that, then you're just deceiving yourself. Amen. Either one can be called a circle. And in fact, if you really wanted to get really, really, really technical about it, if you take the, the two-dimensional object of a circle, which has a definition of every point on the circumference being equal distance from the center of how you even get a circle, is that every single point is, has the same distance. It's a definition. And apply that to a three-dimensional object, you will have a sphere. Because every single point on that surface is going to be equal distance from the center. But I'm not even saying that that is the automatic proof either. I'm just saying like that's, if you were to take it really literally, then, then that's, that's what I think. But I won't even, you know, I'll prove this and say, okay, yeah, it's a circle. I think it's a globe. I think it proves what I believe, but this isn't saying it's flat. So again, it's a, it's a failure on the shape, as far as the shape of it being flat or, or curved. Let's continue here. So it says earth measured with a line means it's not a curve. We already saw in Job 38. This isn't talking about like a Again, a two-dimensional line. You, or construction people, right? Are you able to use a line 
to measure things that, that have a curve to them. Would you call that a line? Right. Like a string or something? Can you measure a circumference with a line? Right. Yeah, you take your line and you wrap it around and you get your circumference, right? I mean, is that would that just be a gross miss, like, like you can't call it that, no one calls it that. You take a line to make the measurement and you can measure the line. It's, um, that's, not, that's not some, oh, it has to be flat. Um, let's see, extremely, extremely large area of land is flat. So they go to Ezekiel 45, 1. Ezekiel 45, 1. Moreover, when you shall divide by lot the land for inheritance, you shall offer an oblation unto the Lord, and holy portion of the land, the length shall be the length of five and twenty thousand reeds, and the breadth shall be ten thousand. This shall be holy in all the borders thereof round about. So they're trying to say that, well, look, this is approximately 52 miles uh, long and a width of approximately 20, 20 miles without any curvature, only flat. So they're putting the burden of proof of saying, well, you have to say that there's curvature there or else there's not. Nobody does that or ever does that when you're giving, my, hey, how far is it from here to Chicago? You're going to say how many miles it is. Right. Oh, well, you didn't say there's curvature, so there's no curvature. So it just must be flat. That's the same line of thinking that they're using as an argument for saying Ezekiel 45, oh, well, it has to be flat. Does it say that it's completely flat? No, it says this is what the length is. Right. And it's giving you a measurement and a distance that you could measure whether it's flat or curved yeah. because it's that many miles or reeds or whatever the unit measurement is from here to here. What if, what if you're going up a mountain? That's not flat, but you can still give a measurement. It says a plane, in quotes, can't, e can't exist on a ball, only a flat level surface of which Yeshua, a.k.a. Jesus, stood upon. Now there's also, I think, which is really going beyond the comprehension of a lot of people, when you have a really large object, you know, it's easy to look at a, at a, at a little ball, a toy, and say, yeah, it's kind of curved everywhere. But everything is relative to your size. The bigger the object is, is in comparison to the person observing, the more that shape is going to change the way that it appears to you. So when you have a really small observing point in a really large object that is a sphere or a circle, you're going to have an appearance of being flat in the, 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 the cross section that you're viewing. So, and this isn't going to work as well on a, on a, on a smaller scale, but it, you know, here's a circle, roughly, right? Okay. If you, you know, when you look at a section like this, you're going to see this arc. It's curved here. The more narrow you get when you chop sections that are really close together, you won't see the curvature. Because, right, obviously, if you get really, really close together, all you're going to have is just like a dot, a point, right? And then and the further along you go and kind of expand that outward, you're still not going to see that it's actually curving. You're just going to see, oh, well, it just looks like a, a line. And when you have the really big object and a really small person, it's going to look flat. That's where the observance comes from. I mean, it's not a, it's not a hard concept to grasp. And you're going to have relative flatness. And the Earth, even though you have a, a, you know, even on a globe, nobody's saying that you don't have different shapes in between. Because we have mountains, we have plains, we have, you know, all the time. I, my backyard slopes down and stuff. That doesn't, that doesn't prove anything, especially over, over a short distance, right? But then bring that out to the magnitude. 
uh, in order to apply. You can't apply something that small to, you know, I can't say, well, because my backyard slopes down like this, well, then the whole earth must continue doing, no, that would be ridiculous, right? It's silly. You have to, to expand your, your testing area. Um, paths are straight and not curved is one point. Let's see, what am I close to? There's a lot, there's a lot of verses given for this, just to say that paths are straight. How does that say that the earth is flat? I don't know. But that's what they're saying, that paths are straight. Now, is that even true? A path. Because I've taken a lot of paths. I, I like hiking. I've taken trails and paths. I've never been on a path that just remains straight, right. straight through the woods, that it just has to be straight and never curved. But I guess when you want to really prove something really bad, you don't care about being intellectually honest. <coughs> Lead me, O Lord, in thy righteousness because of mine enemies. Make thy way straight before my face. See, that proves the earth's flat. What if I took a straight path up a mountain? You can go in a line, and you could go up and down and still be going in a line. That would be a straight path. You cannot just start using things as proof because you just want to grab at everything you possibly can. It makes the argument look even that much more ridiculous, which is what I'm trying to demonstrate today. That this is, so I'm not gonna, we're not going to turn to all the other verses that say that you know, straight paths. Okay, debunked. Waters are straight, not curved. Really? Hmm. I'm going to go to this one. I, I, and you know what? I didn't look up all these passages before, <laughs> before the sermon. Just so you know, I'm just looking at what, I looked at a few of them, but Job 37, 10 By the breath of God, frost is given. And the breadth of the waters is straightened. Now, the word straightened there is not S-T-R-A-I-G-H-T. It's S-T-R-A-I-T. kind of a, a bit significant difference in the word. Because a straight, like the Straits of Gibraltar, is different than straight, as in, say, one direction. And definitely neither one say flat, but the assertion is waters are straight, not curved. Has anyone ever seen a water drop? So water drop flat, or is there curvature on it? In fact, water molecules are all round. And water, have you ever filled up a glass to the top, to where you can actually get the water over the top of the glass, and you can see a curve? So by nature, is water inherently just always going to be flat? Or can water bend its shape? Does water actually have properties that allows it to curve? Right. You can see that at the smallest of levels. Why is it so difficult to understand that, yeah, water can and does curve, especially when there's forces acting on it? But that's the only verse they had for waters are straight, not curved. And they said waters are straight, S-T-R-A-I-G-H-T, and the Bible says S-T-R-A-I-T. Yep. Earthquakes shake earth and does not move. Okay, and, and here's, here's one of the problems that they have too, and we're not, we're not going to get to all these verses. There's no way. 
I'm going to try to get through as many of these points as I can. I'm going to cover up what I think I need to again this evening because I don't want to do this again. But, and then they say earth is fixed and immovable. Again, understand the language, okay? Which, to me, this just kind of, they're just self-contradicting themselves anyways. When the Lord talks about the earth being fixed, the earth being unmovable, it doesn't mean that there's no motion on earth. It's, it's the same way of saying, you know, Psalm 15, you know, he that doeth these things shall never be moved. And it's talking about a person right. never being moved, right? Why take that literally? So, in an hour from now, and two hours from now, and three hours from now, I can't move because I'm doing those things in the Bible. So, I mean, it's, it's talking about me. I can't be moving anywhere. I can have nose velocity. I have nothing because I can't be moved because I'm abiding in the tabernacle. It's silly. It's absurd to take a language that's saying, oh, well, you could never be moved, and just say, well, then that means you physically just can't ever move. No, it's talking about, you know, your direction. How about, you know, God is going to establish the earth that it cannot be moved is different than is there actually any, you know, any velocity in, in, in its, you know, of, of where it exists. It's a different being moved. It's referring to a different thing. It's not talking about the... Because again, the earth does move when there's an earthquake. But the other, the other problem that a lot of flat earthers have is the differentiation between earth meaning the entire planet versus earth meaning the dry ground. Because both can be used, and we use both in our language today. When we talk about the earth, you could be referring to the planet, or you could be referring to some dirt that you pick up in your hand. And more often, what you're going to find when God talks about the ends of the earth, it's talking about the dry land. And even in Genesis chapter 1, he called the dry land earth. So your, your common definition is going to come from that. So when you see all these unto the ends of the earth, yeah, because then you get to the sea. It's not because there's a, a barrier or, or some other thing on, on a flat, pla on a flat, I can't even call it a plan, on, on a flat uh, earth. It's, it's referring to the ground. So you, and the Bible uses it both. Okay, so you got to look at the context and understand what it's talking about. Whether it's talking about the entire planet or just the, the ground. Because the ground does move in earthquakes. That doesn't mean that the, that the whole planet is movable. And movable in the sense of what direction is it going? What is the course that God has for it? Because you being unmovable... That's the course you're on. That's abiding in the tabernacle of the Lord. It's not the actual physical movement. It's where are you going? Yeah. Right? In, in, a, in a more abstract way of thinking, where am I going yeah. in life? Where am I headed in life? That doesn't necessarily have to do anything to do with, with spatially what am I doing. It's a different type of direction. The earth is immovable in one sense and can move, like with earthquakes, in another sense. <sighs> no explanation on this one. He just puts, be still and know that I am God. That's it. Okay, I, I, I'm changing my mind now. The earth's flat. <laughs> be still and know that I am God. Okay. I, I'm not even going to comment on that one. Earth has pillars and hangs on nothing. Amen. But again, that has nothing to do with proving. So I'm going to try to... Uh, I'm gonna, oh man. We're not going to turn all the verses. Let's just explain some of the concepts here. 
when you're trying to <coughs> prove something, you have to consider alternatives. How else can this be viewed? And you have to test them to, make, to, to see what all is going to line up. There's points here, like I said, circle doesn't have to mean it's a, it's a disk. It doesn't have to. It can be a disk or a sphere. Pillars doesn't mean it has to be a column yeah. that's vertical and straight and only works on a flat surface. You can have pillars that support circular objects. Think about the spokes on a wheel can be considered pillars. That's an option. And it's a valid option. And there's nothing wrong with that. So you can't just take, this is what my point is, you can't just take these and say, well, that just proves that it has to be flat. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Earth has a face. Oh, I love this. Earth has a face, a geometrical flat surface. So, so he keeps giving his own definitions on things. Well, Earth has a face which is geometrically a flat surface. So any time now it's talking about the face, the face of the deep, the face of the waters, it's going to say it has to be flat. I have a face. Is my face flat? No, in fact, my face is more like a sphere than probably any other object. My well, my face, it has curves. I have a mountain right here. I've got divots. I've got all kinds of, of things. And my head would be more spherical. So the face of the deep doesn't have to be flat, and it's part of a sphere. So he gives all kinds of verses that talk about a face. I think that's already easily shown that a face doesn't have to have just a flat connotation to it. Now, a face can be used to have a flat connotation. It can. I'm not going to deny that either. But to use this as a proof that this, this is what it proves, you can't do that. It doesn't work. So he has earth has a face and then he has waters has a face. And again, both times he's saying it's a geometrically flat surface. Like that's, that's the only way you could understand this. No, no it's not. Oh, th yeah, this is funny too. It says, in reference to Genesis 1-2, have you ever heard of the abyssal plains? Abyssal plains cover more than 50% of, of earth. Also, they are some of the, the flattest, smoothest areas on earth. It is impossible for the abyssal plains to cover more than 50% of the earth and for the earth to be a sphere. Perhaps the earth is flat. So there is a link on this abyssal plain. So it's talking about underwater and in the, in the deep, right? These great expanses beneath the ocean on the ocean floor where they call them the abyssal plains. Okay. Just like you could have planes above there. But what, what he's trying to say, though, is that, well, a plane has to be just 100% flat, like completely flat. And if you have that on more than 50%, then you can't have a sphere because even if it starts to curve, you know, it, it has to be flat. So that's the, the argument he's making. But he has a link to where, to the site that's talking about the abyssal planes. And on that same site, when you keep reading, because he's kind of just using their information, it talks about the sphere. So even in that, because he's using their definition of the abyssal planes, but they're not using the word planes as it has to be an absolute flat. It's a relative. It's a, it's a yeah, you get down there and it's smooth, right? They're not even saying, you know, the people who are referring to abyssal planes that he's referring to, that he's linking to, are not saying it. It's, you know, they understand that, that it does curve. But when you look at it, it looks flat. When you go, if you were to go down to the ocean floor, it's going to look like it's flat. Sky has a face. Again, the face thing. Earth has ends. I already dealt with that. Again, here's a lot of verses on the earth having ends. Earth has four corners and four quarters. And again, okay, this is another great example of taking the earth or taking the, taking the Bible literally. Now, it is literal when you talk about the corners, but it doesn't mean not every corner has to be a sharp pointed edge like this. 
because the Bible refers to not marring the corners of your beard and of your head. So your head can have corners, and the corners are literally talking about quarters. It's another usage of the word. But you can't say, well, you're not taking the Bible literally because, because you're using a definition that I, you know, that I don't like or whatever. But it's, a, but it's a valid definition, and it is the one that's being used. It's the only one that makes sense. Now, they will also say, uh, I think, agree on this point, just that, that they're quarters. But how does that have to do, why, how does that only prove flat versus a sphere? You could have four quadrants in a sphere just as much as you could have four quadrants on a disc. Just, just so, you know. Uh, and then the, the movement, okay, lots of verses on sun moves, not the earth. Covered that already. And then, note, the Bible uses, and I don't know if I've read this, Uses, the, the, uses words that describe the sun with only a few known exceptions as moving, though some believe that words like rising and down imply the sun is moving up and down over the alleged curvature of the earth. In addition to spinning globe earth, believing Christians completely missing the fact that the Bible uses words which describe the sun as moving, they also fail to analyze, oh yeah, this is the original Hebrew and Greek meaning of those same words. So this guy likes to go back to the, to the Greek and Hebrew and try to change what the Bible actually says. Because again, that's, that's, that's the best way for, for people to make doctrines fit, is go back to the Greek and Hebrew and look up on a concordance and say, well, this word really means this. That is, that is common. So, now I didn't, we didn't go to all the verses, but I covered all the main points. You could go online and check it for, out for yourself. If you don't believe me, um, I feel like we covered the main points that they were making. You can look up every single one of those verses if you like. But last point, we're a little bit over time, but that's okay because there's a couple other things that I've heard. And I'm not going to get to everything. There's no way I'm going to get to everything. last little scientific points because some of these are just really, really easy to, to understand and to see and to prove. Time zones are observed, right? Well, and here, man, there's, there's so much. Some of the models I've seen for the the Earth moving. They've got two different orbits. They've got, they've got one going over the Tropic of Cancer and then over the Tropic of Capricorn and over the equator and it has to kind of shift its circuit going around both of those in order to get the seasons. So that's how their model works. But then the problem with that is because you have, where's my circle? Let's use my circle as a disk. Okay, so here's our circle, and here's your equator and your tropics, right? So again, exaggerated, but the sun's going to have to be moving here, here, and here. Well, the one on the circle on the inside has much smaller distance, right? And then there's more here, and then there's more here. In their model, the sun's going to travel around once in 24 hours. Okay. If you have less distance to go, if the sun were moving at the same speed, then you would have a shorter day at different seasons. We don't observe that. So the only way to compensate for that is that the sun has to be moving slower when it's going here and faster when it's going around out here in order to maintain 24-hour days. We don't observe that either. You can gauge how fast the sun is moving very easily. You could do the, the, the degrees by which it moves over time. Using angles and simple geometry and time to see 
We don't observe a faster moving sun and a slower moving sun. We do observe different heights in the sky, perception from where we're at. But not, not speed, not the velocity of the moon. And that's just one example. And what you'll find is that they have many models, many different models, because they're trying to answer each individual objection, but they can never all come together and fit one because, it's, because it doesn't work, because it's not flat, because it only is going to work on a globe. When you have the same thing, when you have time zones, time zones going across like this, okay? So you have one time zone here, one here, one here, one here, one here. On a flat, you're going to have a, a much larger distance between the time zones when you, the further down you get, so like into the southern hemisphere of the, of the Earth. Whereas on a globe, it's going to come out and then go back in for your, for your distance on the lines because of the shape of the Earth. Again, very easy to show just using real simple calculations, observances. You have the technology to talk to people in different time zones. Measurements aren't that hard to make over, you know, and, and again, this also then changes the distance, like over ocean, going from here to here on the flat earth map versus having it be a globe because at the bottom it'll bring it all back together again. Very easy. The only way that you can rely on this is saying, well, the government's covering it all up. It's covering up the whole world and not allowing people to, to make those types of observations and those changes. That's all we have time for this morning. Come back tonight. We're going to go over something that's not just applicable to flat earth. It's, it's applicable to everything. It's just, just logical, um, just reasoning skills and, and being able to understand scripture and stuff. I'm sorry if it was a little dry for you this morning, but I, I wanted to just do it one time and I'm not coming back to it again. Okay, it's going to be posted online. It's going to be archived. And you know what? If, if, you, if you believe that, I love you. But don't be duped by this stuff. And, you know, I don't think this is the biggest thing in the world anyways, and, and I hope you don't either. But I've seen the danger of, of people who just, when they get involved with this, everything becomes flat, everything becomes flat earth. It's practically like a flat earth gospel. Okay, and that's, that's not, it's not by any stretch of the imagination the main thing, just as evidenced on how much information the Bible is really giving us about the shape. It's not as, it's not as big of a deal. So, let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for your words and for um, just providing us with, with truth and knowledge and wisdom, Lord. I pray that you please help us all to, uh, to grow in our understanding and to um, just be faithful to your words, Lord. I pray that you please help us to not fall into to foolishness and foolish thinking, Lord, and that you would um, just lead us and direct us and, and uh, give us knowledge. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.